Now, in conclusion, I wish to address one other very different issue, one that is widely regarded as having altered the very nature of museums as institutions. I refer to a phenomenon that has variously been characterized as the museum going from being mission-driven to market-driven, or put another way, from collection-driven to audience-focused, with a primary emphasis now on the social contract. It is worth quoting here the late Stephen Weil of the Smithsonian, the most prominent apologist for this paradigm shift. He applauds, and I quote him, that collections, historically viewed as the center of museum activities, have now moved toward a supporting role as no longer the primary measure of value for a museum. Rather, it is service to its public that has become the core measuring stick, end of quote. In noting the gradual change in the museum from repository to activity center, what is really meant is a shift in emphasis from the experience of art to the experience of the museum itself, to a holistic approach that embraces first the amenities, many of which in themselves are a good thing, the programs, the ancillary offerings from shops to cafeterias, music, poetry, dance in the galleries, and so forth, how far we have come or slipped from the ideals expressed at the birth of the museum in the Age of Enlightenment was well expressed by Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the architect of the Altus Museum in Berlin around 1830, when he proclaimed that his grand facades and interiors were meant as places where, as he put it, this is Schinkel speaking, the individual could recollect himself and prepare himself for the mysteries that awaited him. It was not to be a social place, but rather a place where the individual divorced himself from society. You'll notice that I do not include in my list of extraneous amenities the new electronic media such as websites. Because for me, this is mostly the museum fuori le mura, unambiguously supplemental and useful, where computer screens encroach on the exhibits themselves, as happens more and more, that is another matter. What I was speaking of in referring to all these amenities and their often aggressive promotion is a shift in emphasis where so much more attention seems to be devoted to what surrounds the work of art rather than to the work of art itself, a phenomenon that the eminent art historian Ernst Gombrich described or decried as the museum killing admiration with kindness. This is a shift that I have myself on occasion rude, wondering if Hector's exhortation in Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida might not be to the point. Tis mad idolatry to make the service greater than the God. Today, with a little distance perhaps, I am prepared to be, to be truthful, rather more indulgent. First, because I have become increasingly impatient with snobbishness and self-righteousness. And second, because if we're really willing to look objectively, on the whole, Museums have kept their extraneous activities largely separate from where the art is shown. Are the ancillary activities and their promotion really so dominant as to be a distraction to the appreciation of art? Or on the contrary, a perfectly suitable, even effective invitation to such appreciation? So the deeper question should be, Ought we not have more faith in the power of the work of art to transcend these possible distractions and in the visitor's own ability to, to transcend them? Let's face it, promotional efforts and overwrought rhetoric are often no more than that. We are, after all, in a world where communication and marketing are ubiquitous and dominant, but experience shows us that they do produce results and in the end, they can serve the mission, both democratic and pluralistic. For the range of responses to art, of course, is likely to be as varied as the audiences are diverse. Some will respond aesthetically, 
others in a learned fashion. Some will be bemused, others indifferent, and some will respond somatically. This is a somatic response, using the body. And then others will respond for the record. Obviously, a museum can't arrange things to try and anticipate all these responses, but it has done its job if it provides through a thoughtful, pleasing, and intelligent installation the conditions for that unhurried, inquisitive gaze without which we cannot live fully the work of art. The capacity of the eye to see a whole image in literally the blink of an eye makes it very difficult, as we all know, to devote to any work of art the requisite time. And it is a matter of time for that searching and inquiring look. And perhaps before a work of art, we should consider intoning as if to oneself, as well as to the work of art, that cri du coeur of Faust at the end of Goethe's tale, Verweile doch, du bist so schön. Wait, linger, thou art so fair. Because it is hard to linger. Museums, it's in their inherently contradictory nature, contradictory nature, do not make it easy for the work of art to detain the eye. They show them to so many people at once in so many compelling progressions from gallery to gallery. This has the virtue, of course, of allowing us to grasp much of the complexity and character of a culture, a style, an artist. But a museum must, almost, must also promote the experience of a singularity. Encourage a truly meaningful colloquy between visitor and work of art. A conversation à deux, leisurely, even intense, and one from which its antecedents in the Wunderkammer should also not be forgotten, and that is the sense of wonder. Thank you.